Welcome, my dear students and others, to chapter 10, in which I will teach you about gases. Before beginning, I would like to share with you an old, funny video from my YouTube channel. The link is posted right here and in the description below, solely for the purpose of hopefully entertaining you. You're welcome to click it and hopefully enjoy it. With that out of the way, after this lecture and a series of lectures that will follow, and they will all be linked to each other in sequence, you will gain the following skills. You will be able to understand the basic characteristics of gases, be able to interconvert between different units of pressure, be able to define the terms ideal gas and STP, know the volume of an ideal gas at STP, and perform calculations using the combined gas law taken from our text, which is also referenced in the description below. So that's what we're gonna do. Let's get into it. So thus far this semester in this class, we've talked mostly about individual atoms and small molecules. In real life, however, we do not have direct experiences with atoms and molecules. Instead, we interact with matter as gases, liquids, and solids, which are comprised of enormous amounts or numbers of atoms and molecules. So in this chapter, we will discuss gases. Before beginning though, I'm going to first describe solids and liquids to you at a molecular level. I do this so you can better contrast solids and liquids with gases, which I will then describe afterward. We begin then with solids. So generally speaking, solids have a constant volume and shape, and their particles actually are constantly moving, colliding with other particles and changing their direction and velocity, which might seem hard to believe when you look at a solid just sitting there, but it's true at a molecular or atomic level. Though they do not move as quickly as liquids and gases individual particles. Additionally, in solids, each particle is trapped in a small cage with walls around it formed by other solid particles that are strongly attracted to each other. Now we'll learn about the nature of solids by looking at an engine block, which is made of a solid, steel. This image, by the way, is taken from an excellent chemistry textbook written by Mark Bishop, which is referenced in the description below. So if you were able to zoom in on the engine block made of steel really, really closely, you would see that it is actually made up of zillions of tiny particles that do move. They bump into and tug at each other while staying more or less in the same place. Now, as the temperature inside the engine block rises, these particles move faster and faster and bump into each other harder and harder and with higher speed. Then when the temperature increases enough, neighboring particles push further and further apart and the solid steel expands. Now to the basic characteristics of liquids. So liquids have constant volumes, but variable shapes. Their particles move around more quickly than those of solids. This movement breaks the attraction that would form an analogous structural cage inside solids. And as a result, each particle in a liquid is constantly moving from one part of the liquid to another. If you can imagine zooming in, at an atomic or molecular level on a liquid, such as the liquid contained in the speaker. You would see the liquid's particles do move quickly enough for attractions with neighboring particles to be constantly broken and reformed. Moreover, particles are less organized than in solid with slightly more space in between them and particles move throughout the container, which keeps the liquid shape. Now, when liquids evaporate, you can imagine zooming in at the surface of a liquid really closely. First of all, heat from the surroundings causes the liquid particles to move more and more quickly. Eventually, particles on the top of the liquid, that is the liquid surface, start getting kicked out by neighboring particles because those particles are moving with increasing speed because of increasing surrounding heat. The kick then propels this particle out of the liquid, which means that it is now traveling too fast for the attractions from the liquid particles below to draw it back in, which does what? Yeah, it converts it into a gas molecule. So this is at an atomic or molecular level, how liquids convert into gases, which brings us to gases basic characteristics. So gases have variable shape and volume. Their particles move and zoom around much more quickly than those of liquid and solids. Gas particles have larger distances between them on average than the particles of liquids and solids. Gas particles experience comparatively little attraction to each other and constant collisions between gas particles lead to constant changes in their direction and velocity. You can imagine if you were looking at a sample of gas coming out of this exhaust, for example, that because the particles are so far apart, there is usually no significant attraction between them. And gas particles also move in straight paths, changing direction and speed when they knock into each other. As I learned once upon a time at a Philadelphia Science Observatory, at a molecular level, solids move like this, liquids move like this, and gases move like this. Oh! Again, solids, liquids and gases, oh! like that. You got it? Good. 
Now we move on to pressure. So according to our textbook, which is referenced in the description beneath this video, in everyday terms, pressure conveys the idea of force, a push that tends to move something in a given direction. Pressure P is defined in science as the force F that acts upon a given area A. Gases then exert a pressure on any surface with which they are in contact. The gas in an inflated balloon, for example, exerts a pressure on the inside surface of that balloon to keep its shape. The SI unit for pressure is a Pascal. Now, some other commonly used pressure units include atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, pounds per square inch, and tor, which are mathematically interrelated as shown in this table down here. You can see, for example, that one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury and 760 tor. What does that mean? Well, it means that one tor is equal to one millimeter of mercury. Make sense? Good. So on Earth, all of us experience something called atmospheric pressure. This is caused essentially by the pressure or weight exerted upon our bodies by all of the gas molecules above us all the way to the outer atmosphere. For instance, if you were standing right here in the middle of the country somewhere, the combined weight of all of the gas molecules between your body and the outer atmosphere of the Earth all pushing down on you is the atmospheric pressure. Now, it should make sense that at higher altitudes, that is, if you are on top of a mountain, you would experience lower atmospheric pressure because you'd be at a higher altitude. There would be fewer molecules between you and the outer atmosphere of the Earth pushing down on you. Make sense? At lower altitudes, of course, we see the reverse. We get higher atmospheric pressures because there's more distance between us at lower altitudes and the upper atmosphere, hence more molecules weighing down upon us. Now, as we go underwater, we experience the combined pressures of all of the water molecules above us, plus all of the gas molecules in the atmosphere above them. And this is very compounding pressure, which is why it feels so intense when you dive down into water, even at depths that, relatively speaking, are not that deep. So scientists have devised a series of laws to help us understand and predict gases' behaviors. Before delving into these, however, we have to understand first, STP, or standard temperature pressure, is defined as one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius, which is the same thing as 273.15 kelvins. An ideal gas is a theoretical or hypothetical gas whose pressure, volume, and temperature relationships can all be predicted by the ideal gas law, which I will explain to you later on. Most gases are ideal gases at some range around STP. Gases begin to behave non-ideally under extreme temperatures, pressures, and volumes. And one mole of any ideal gas, regardless of its molecular or atomic weight at STP, has a volume of 22.41 liters. Now, one of these mathematical laws we'll use for gases is called the combined gas law, which is equation 10.8, shown right here, taken from our text, where P1, V1, and T1 are the initial pressure, volume, and temperature, while P2, V2, and T2 are the final pressure, volume, and temperature in any gas system that experiences adjustment. Now, the beauty of this equation is that it allows us to predict gases' new pressures, volumes, or temperatures if we vary any of those things from initial conditions. Which takes us to a problem that will end this video. A fixed amount of a gas at 21C exhibits a pressure of 752 torr and occupies a volume of 5.12 liters. Now, using the combined gas law, I want you to calculate the new volume the gas will occupy if the pressure is changed to 1.88 atmospheres while the temperature is held constant. And separately, I want you to calculate the new volume that that gas will occupy if the temperature is increased to 175 degrees C while the pressure is held constant. Now, I'm not going to solve these questions here for you, but I will post a link in the description below and possibly flowing above me as an in-video link card to a separate video in which I will. Until next time, my dear students and others, please have an enjoyable rest of your day. What? <laughs>